petrified to be a moderator of this panel discussion today. So uh, talking about the agenda of this panel, firstly, I am going to set some ground rules for our panel today, for our discussion today. Then I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists, and then we are going to have some Q&A. And then finally, we're going to open up for the audience to take some questions. So before we begin with all those fancy introduction, I would like you all to imagine waking up tomorrow and the very tools designed for you to protect the organization are now being used against you. Driven by the unpredictable power of AI in a world where digital transformation accelerates uh, the uh, and uh, at the breakneck speed, the role of CISO is evolving faster than ever. But how do you prepare yourself for the threats uh, you can't even predict? So today we'll explore how the future of cybersecurity lies at the intersection of the innovation and uncertainty and how leaders can stay one step ahead from the dynamic landscape. And for this, we have came up with the topic of today's discussion, which is the future of cybersecurity, how CISOs can prepare for the unpredictable threats for generative AI and digital transformation. For this, we have invited industry CXOs from uh, various uh, industry experience, calling out our esteemed, uh, esteemed panelists. First, Mr. Do uh, Dr. Yusuf Hashmi, Group CISO at Jubilant uh, Bhartia Group. So Dr. Yusuf Hashmi is a seasoned cybersecurity expert with deep expertise in emerging cyber threats and risk management strategies. He's dedicated to enhancing the organizational security through innovative solution and thought leadership. On the personal front, he is passionate nature lover, maintains his nature aquarium at his home, having 25 species of underwater plants. So that is exciting to know. Uh, the second panelist, we have Mr. Vikram Danda, CISO at Virtusa, having spent over six years on board India's first two aircraft carriers, INS, INS Vikrant and INS Virat. So have moved from Homeland Defense to Cyber Defender now. Have had the pleasure of seeing sunrises and sunset from the same spot out at sea. He was also ranked third in the folk list so calling out the third panelist, Mr. Suresh Sharma, CISO at PayU, with over 19 years of expertise in cybersecurity, product development, and people management. So now let's jump into the conversation with our panelists. So I would now like to uh, ask uh, our first panel, Dr. Yusuf Hashmi, what are your views uh, in using micro segmentation, network segmentation, and behavioral analytics to reduce the attack surface? improve security and respond to threats in real time. Uh, Iqbal, thank you so much. Uh, very pertinent question. And it's a big, uh, three major big areas that we try to discuss. So in a short period of time, what we need to understand first that how does this area will benefit me as an organization? Uh, what are the use cases that I'm trying to solve, right? So every organization will have uh, different uh, uh, method, environment, the context that uh, you lay down these controls in fact. So very importantly, micro segmentation is going to be a game changer for sure because the kind of uh, risk and threats which are currently getting proliferated across the organization, right? So uh, it's really difficult in a growing enterprise environment to actually curtail or contain uh, that proliferation, right? So because uh, as an example, if you see when a ransomware gets actually uh, uh, being implanted, right, into your network, right? And when it gets laterally moved and you are having a flat network, it is very, I think, literally become impossible to contain uh, the spread of the ransomware or the lateral move. So it's very important uh, how are we are going to, it's very essential to understand and understand the strategies that the organization lead. So micro segmentation definitely is one of the uh, major upcoming technologies uh, which will help the organization to actually uh, uh, contain, uh, have a real containment strategy into your organization. Because uh, the point is that I think uh, when you talk about micro segmentation, when we talk about network segmentation, we are largely network segregated. Uh, I know we have uh, VLANs and mm -hmm. are being already created to actually spread, uh, stop the spread going laterally, move into the other segment. But that is not enough, actually, 
in a current scenario. You need to have laid down your defenses by micro segment at the workload level, right? So usually we do the segmentation at the network level, but what about the workloads, right? What about the endpoint devices, right? So uh, in a typical uh, multi or a, uh, you can say cross-functional group scenarios, uh, usually in the group companies, you have acquisitions. So it's very difficult to actually uh, have a strategy to have create a logical segment. Uh, across uh, your organization. So micro segmentation definitely will help you to actually create a smaller segment within your network segment in order for you to actually monitor and have a great visibility across. You, sh you should be able to know that what's happening in my uh, small pocket because when you create a larger segment in a flat network, it's really going to be difficult for you to actually monitor and have an observability. So I think uh, it will play a major role uh, uh, to in the next in the near future, right? And it will definitely reduce your attack surface because uh, if you are able to limit your lateral movement within the network, right? Uh, attackers will find it very harder to move from one compromise segment to another. I think it's very essential, and this will really help you actually to make that make it happen. And of course, uh, visibility and the security aspect will anyhow come into picture, and. Uh, I think once you actually do that, and of course, behavior analytics will actually help you to identify and predict your threats, uh, identify those behaviors, right? And AI will play a major role because you have larger uh, amount of volumes of data that's guys process. So I think it's very essential to create a framework which has a combined benefit uh, that will help you to actually create a layer defense. Uh, it will improve your uh, threat detection and response, right? And of course, uh, once you have that in place, uh, uh, it will overall strengthen your security posture. So the strategies that you have collectively strengthen the security will make it more resilient against various threat or threat of attacks. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, that was a comprehensive overview. Uh, it's clear uh, the, how micro segmentation and network segmentation are becoming vital uh, tool. So moving around with our uh, next question to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Vikram Dhanda, what are the strategies are you implementing to address the security risk associated with legacy system and application during your organization digital transformation journey? Yeah. So first of all, I would just like to add to what uh, Dr. Yusuf Hashmi said. You know, I sort of agree with. Uh, that approach, that if you have segmentation, you can uh, stop the lateral spread. Now, if you take it a step further, if you can hide something completely from the internet, that's the ideal situation. As it is said in certain quarters, that reachable is breachable. The one is, as I said, hiding from it. And that's what you do with your legacy stuff. That hide it. Don't let it be seen on the internet. And whatever has to be seen on the internet must be seen for a very specific reason. And even if it is meant to be seen from across the board, from the entire open internet, well, in that case, at a minimum, put it behind a, a, a WAF, a web application firewall. So it's the whole game of cybersecurity ultimately boils down to two things. And those in my mind are improve the security posture, reduce the risk. And if you can do these two things, it doesn't matter whether it's a modern approach, a legacy approach, a legacy application, a modern application. If you can do these two things, it's just a question of doing it repeatedly, you achieved your objective. I think, uh, thank you for sharing those uh, insights. It's always interesting to hear how security leaders uh, like you are navigating the tricky balance between uh, managing the legacy uh, systems and uh, innovation. So uh, moving ahead with the uh, third question to our uh, third panelist, uh, uh, Suresh Sharma. What are the most uh, significant cybersecurity challenges that you are uh, facing in the wake of digital transformation and generative AI? And how are you leveraging AI and machine learning to enhance your cybersecurity capabilities? Um, it's a pretty mouthful of words, generative AI. <clears throat> our, our, our fundamental challenge with with the with this funny technology is we are living AI for the past 
seven years. Uh, now we are talking about it. The damage, let's not point about it, but uh, the technology is not governed right now. That means there is no boundary set for this technology. Fundamentally, what happens is the moment you allow, it will do everything. You just have to say, just allow, and then it will track you, it will spy on you, it will do a lot of things. Benefits are there, definitely. You can get to know a good restaurant or all across your nearby places. You get to see a good hotel, best rates. You see, the benefits are there. The challenge is, how about if I say that, you know, uh, in the business like finance, it can do a good predictions, but if it is not governed the right way, it will put us into a fraud situation every now and then, right? So, so ours is a, is a very small business, unlike, uh, you know, uh, my fellow panelists. We we are into a very different orthodox field of world, which, which is very divergent. We extensively use generative AI into multiple ways to support the customers for seamless transactions. A challenge is more useful, more versatile. We need to set the right guardrails in place. Um, Somebody can say why why guardrail is putting in at this point of time, why not seven years back? Well, the thing is that I think we realize that you know the power and the potential of this this whole technology is we are trying to use it in a very different order altogether. How we do it, we would we we use it to monitor us. So we are we are using AI against that means if you if you see a bot, we can, can you understand the bot? Yes, you can. But if a bot starts acting like a human, can you capture stop? Maybe not, right? So bot has to understand about. So we use things like this. Uh, that's that's something which we are trying to do. And my uh, point is, you know, put the right guardrails. That means the governance, the right policies for employees. Teach them what has to be done, how to use it. More extensive training programs of using AI, not learning AI. Believe me, there are two two very important differences. The third piece is. If you have the right guardrails, the right teaching mechanism to people, uh, set AI against AI. Because that is how you will be in a position to actually you know, have a right controls in place. It's as good as like you see Iron Dome. You cannot stop the missiles to be dropping. You can only, there's only one way you can do it is you know kill them when they're in, fire, in, in air. So that's a piece for myself. Uh, that was really a useful uh, suggestion, uh, I think, uh, Suresh. So uh, moving again uh, with uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, Hashmi, uh, how do you propose uh, preparing for the potential risk associated with the increasing use of AI and machine learning in cybersecurity and how human analytics continuing to play a role alongside uh, with AI-powered tools? Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, I think AI is becoming slowly and gradually being part of your business uh, operations. Uh, many of the stuff that we used to actually uh, do it in hours and AI is able to give results uh, in minutes or in seconds itself. So it, there's, uh, there's no question about uh, the kind of turnaround time on a certain activity that AI brings into the table is uh, really uh, uh, fabulous actually, right? So, and it is definitely helping businesses uh, to take uh, actions or decisions, right, uh, may not be accurate, but yes, you have some uh, clear cut uh, actionable coming in from your queries, right, which usually take a lot of time to actually generate, uh, think about, thought about, do research. I think uh, that brings in uh, the, the core benefit of AI is the time uh, it takes to create actions for you to actually drive it. But yes, I think nevertheless, uh, while it brings uh, significant benefits, they are also potential risks uh, that need to be managed very, very carefully. Right? Uh, uh, we need to understand that uh, if you are using AI, so there would be adversary also having the same platform to manipulate and may uh, jeopardize your uh, learn your LLMs, your uh, AI systems. Right? So uh, they are very vulnerable to uh, adversarial attacks, <laughs> where uh, 
those attackers can easily uh, manipulate the inputs to the devices uh, uh, which we are using to actually generate the AI, right? So I think it's very essential, important to have a robust testing before you apply AI in, in your businesses, right? Uh, because these AI uh, have to call for continuous uh, testing. It's just not one of a point in time assessment. It has to be a continuous and robust testing that we need to be done in this uh, in the AI models and right and it's very important uh, to understand and learn and uh, train your uh, LLMs uh, to detect and prevent adversarial attacks as well. So yeah, yeah. it's very very essential to actually manage and create uh, and uh, make your learning LLMs train on those uh, suspicious behavior that might prevail during a running a query, right? So uh, I think very important. And of course, uh, biasness and fairness is always be a major uh, area of concern uh, because most of the AI comes with uh, bias towards uh, a certain region or a certain industry, right, uh, or race. So I think that is something that we need to train and diversify. Uh, the AI model so that it creates a common uh, results, which is acceptable to most of the cases, the context of scenario, irrespective of the region, uh, the location, right, uh, the environment and the context, I think. Third important is data poisoning is a big risk. So att uh, attackers are after to actually poison your data, right? So uh, very important to secure our data pipelines, right? Uh, uh, data quality monitoring is highly essential in your AI model, right? So uh, these are the most, one of the most area and uh, important. Area. Last but the least is the uh, complexity and the transparency, right? So uh, most of the training uh, or the AI models are really in transparent. So we need to have the visibility of how with the sources of data and the inputs and the outputs are generated, uh, the sources that is very essential to actually have that right, to uh, uh, have an explainability of your AI models, right? So uh, we need to deploy and develop AI models which have clear explanation for their decisions. So that is very important. And coming back to the human aspect, of course, uh, AI outputs uh, process large volume of data, right? So there's no question about the ability of AI to process a very large amount of data in order to uh, provide you the right decisions, uh, the right uh, information for you to make decisions. But ultimately, we need to understand the human context cannot be replaced by AIs, right? So there's no uh, alternative for the human context and intelligence that the human comes and trans and uh, transpire that information back to an actionable. You have to have that. I think. Uh, that will never be replace uh, human intelligence in this uh, robotics or AI model, right? So uh, I think that is what the main important, uh, uh, it calls for a uh, continuous improvement and that will only be coming when you actually deep analyze uh, the results that are coming in the trends uh, uh, because most of the AI models come with a lot of hallucinations, I think, uh, no real uh, kind of uh, outcome, which is usually practically possible. So all of these aspects need to be taken care of. I think we would be able to uh, create uh, a combined efficiency uh, impact between AI and intelligence. It will create a lot of outcome and benefits to the organization if we actually have a real balance of uh, uh, versus automation versus uh, the human intelligence coming into the picture. I think actually it's uh, quite clear how powerful AI is, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we have to acknowledge uh, how, uh, you know, uh, 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 human expertise is actually uh, irre irreplaceable over here. So uh, moving ahead uh, with uh, the next question to uh, uh, Vikram Danda, sir. How are you managing the complexity of integrating security into existing infrastructure, dealing with multiple uh, disparate system and securing legacy data as it migrates to new environment like the cloud? Yes, sir. Iqbal, with your permission, can I just first answer a question on the chat over there, which relates to uh, WAF and segmentation, whether that it can't just by itself fix the cybersecurity issue. So Nishikan, first of all, thank you for that comment. 
and uh, i completely agree with you no technology by itself can ever uh, fix a, a problem uh, completely and there'll always be a mix of people process and technology and even in that the mix each part of it has to be shown and confirmed to be working optimally because even if you have the proper mix of people process technology say the process the adherence to the process is not there or the person makes a human mistake you got all the parts all the components but something goes wrong so there has to be continuous work to make sure that there is assurance that all these parts are working together to give you the intended uh, uh, end effect or meet the objective that you want to meet right then coming to your question ikbal yeah see first of all when you talk of legacy legacy is called legacy for a reason legacy is the past right and if you are going to be modernizing if you are going to be moving forward one of the most critical things which i believe does get missed out quite often is that you don't get rid of the non essential legacy <clears throat> we just continue to let it exist because it has existed in the past now what we have found is that a lot of what is brought into existence doesn't have a reconciliation process doesn't have an offboarding process there's an onboarding process for a process for creation but there is no ongoing process for getting rid of it <clears throat> what not it continues to exist just because it was created so it's very uh, vital that one gets rid of whatever is not required and what is not being used as a first step this as you will <clears throat> all agree reduces the work that we need to do greatly it makes sure that you know we have to focus only on that which is needed going forward that's one part okay now how do you integrate this into the uh, into the new ones into the new infrastructure it should always to my mind be a replacement not a supplement and again like most rules this can never be applicable 100% you have to take it on a case by case basis but the because moment you supplement you have got now two things which you need to work on going forward you have to maintain it manage it but i always felt that the hallmark of a completed project should be the retirement of the previous legacy infrastructure we typically stop once the new uh, application or whatever it is goes into production use we forget that there's a legacy which is still existing and that legacy adds to your attack surface so that should be got rid of okay now comes to things like the cloud itself now the cloud is as we all know very different from on prem why is it very different because on prem has a very clearly defined perimeter you protect that perimeter <clears throat> whatever is inside is to a large extent secure with the cloud there is really no perimeter now we have the so called new perimeters what are they things like identity is the new perimeter the device is the new perimeter and then you can add applications network and all the infrastructure itself that's a new perimeter each of them has to be uh, uh, secured <clears throat> so what i am very fond of saying is that you take any element of it today add the word security to it and it's valid api api security i think uh, we lost cloud you. cloud security recently each of these aspects each component of our infrastructure needs to be secured thank you uh, vikram sir for sharing those insights uh, those were really uh, helpful uh, moving around uh, with uh, uh, suresh uh, sir how do you balance the need of for innovation and digital transformation with the needs for robust cyber security especially considering emerging threats and potential uh, vulnerabilities and vikram said the right point actually the innovation is something which we always say you know this is this is no negotiation the challenge is what are we using to to innovate uh for us the way we innovate is for like we first do a research on the technology uh 
that that is something which we started doing for quite some time now uh, what is the research we actually want to understand whether we are using any open source tech stack is it actually causing any kind of uh, backdoor for the organization uh, it's taking some data to china or pakistan that becomes like a very big problem um the second and the most important piece for us is innovation should not have boundaries yeah but generative ai has to have a boundaries <laughs> so so everybody uh, in the innovation field what we do is we actually started working on to the reverse approach altogether number one why can't we actually train our you know ai models to start working for us backwards we are working on automated maintenance model automated maintenance model to support system to support merchants so that engineers can use their creativity dedicatedly only on creating the new stuff so these are the people who train ai to work on ops to work on maintenance i call it as like you know what my domestic housekeeping jobs is done by my ai however still the revenue making pieces are done by the engineers which is what yusuf said is correctly uh, so that's how we are we are trying to keep ourselves focused only on the innovation piece of the next generation uh, ai cannot understand following pieces uh, to everybody who's listening number one they cannot understand what government's mandate is the reason is simple the government's mandates are written in a very very legal language you have to have an interpretation in place that needs years of experience of a lawyer that needs years of experience of a security officer and then you have to you can come to one single conclusion okay this is what is the business is supposed to do right so this is a piece which we don't want to actually uh, put innovation pieces so we still piece in experience at front and then every part of that which we call it as housekeeping job is done by you know the uh, the ai piece uh thanks i know uh, suresh you have to uh, leave now for another call uh, but uh, we are really uh, thankful uh, for uh, you to uh, making out time for all of us uh, today and sharing your uh, valuable uh, insight yeah uh, yeah really thankful sir uh, thanks a lot thank you uh, have a nice day and thanks for inviting this this panel this is fantastic guys thank you thank you sir uh, so uh, moving ahead uh, with the uh, uh, another questions uh, to dr yusuf hashmi Uh, what role do you see uh, security orchestration uh, automation and response sore playing in the future of cyber security and how are you using predictive analytics to anticipate and prepare for security threats yeah sore is a very interesting i have been there for some time uh, but as per the gartner hype cycle uh, it is already in uh, trough of uh, disillusionment which means that uh though there have been earlier adoption of soar but over period of time it has somewhat died down i think uh, uh, and there is a reason to it because soar alone cannot work in its isolation you need to have a lot of skills uh, ability to actually translate those actions uh, uh, so that you are able to take certain actions which are predictive in nature those are repetitive i think the understanding of your overall environment largely sores are been used in an, in a same and sock environment right so and due to the kind of uh, diversities in the uh, alert um uh, environment obviously alert ecosystem uh, most of the sores are unable to actually uh, do the task which you expect uh, it to do and automate so i think uh, uh, it does improve efficiency for sure if you are doing in the if you have the understanding of your context if you have understanding of the use cases uh, uh, or you have developed uh, the playbooks right uh, for most of the use cases which are been touching the socks and all so and it it will definitely help you to actually automate and reduce the amount of alert fatigue usually in comes at the sock right so and of course uh so uh, major use cases comes when you actually uh, translate your alerts uh, into incidents uh, so uh, because of which uh, you are able to integrate that with your itsm uh, which is essentially needed 
as a major use cases for source so that you are able to create an incident automatically uh, once uh, the playbook actually uh, uh, meets the rule set defined in the source. So, but as uh, as I said that uh, it should not uh, become an absolute technology unless you have that ability to understand because SOAR alone will not solve the purpose for you, right? So, and the kind of alerts, the volume of alerts which are growing significantly, if you allow, if you put a SOAR in, in that environment is uh, you going to create problems for you, right? So, uh, incident response, uh, major, major use cases of your SOAR, right? You are able to actually uh, uh, address certain use cases which are repetitive in future. Uh, but the volume uh, of security alerts is going significantly very, very uh, unmanageable, right? So uh, in combination with AI, uh, SOAR would be highly effective as my, my, my views are because AI would be able to assess and create a decision tree for large amount of volume of data. Uh, and that will help source to take the next course of, of, of action to actually create either block certain uh, uh, devices from lateral movement or take a certain create a ticket across uh, your ITSM and many other cases. I think future of source solution uh, will definitely lie uh, advanced AI and machine learning capabilities. Uh, that will significantly enhance uh, your detect threat detection and response. I think this will also help you to enable your predictive analytics and more intelligent automation, right? So uh, your second part of the question was predictive analytics, right? So yes, uh, I think predictive, predictive analytics uh, will definitely help in transforming cybersecurity, uh, right? Uh, uh, from your reactive to proactive approach uh, threat anticipation is a is a major uh, use case of predictive analytic in cyber security so how can i analyze a certain patterns uh, from past incident which we usually ignore because there are sort of large data set which is running behind your uh, incident logs is practically not possible to actually go back to the historical data collect that pattern right and then take the further course of action identify the network behaviors right so i think if we are able to get that uh, intelligence for the huge amount of historical data that you usually collect and actually discard after a span of time maybe six months or one year i think that will really create a lot of uh, uh, benefits in making the use cases for predictive and threat anticipation uh, because all of these threats have some common behavior, right? Over repetitive uh, period of time across. Uh, so I think that will really help uh, them, uh, us to actually make that happen. And anomaly detection, of, of course, uh, when you do a machine learning algorithm, right? Uh, you can identify anomaly in vast uh, amounts of data, right? So I think uh, this will really help in uh, detection uh, and mitigation of attacks. So, uh, how are you able to combine this capability is very uh, essential. AI with combination of uh, SOAR, I think that will give you a holistic view of how you're going to address uh, your uh, threat detection and response. And of course, uh, that will help me in uh, taking my decision much faster, which I usually take and dependent on human uh, factors to actually take. And then that takes a long time. But since Time is most precious as gold in a SOC or a security environment, right? So I think we would be able to take quick decisions uh, and quick actions when we combine these technologies going forward. I think uh, Vikram sir wants to add something on what you said. Yes, I mean, I completely agree with what Dr. Yusuf Hashmi is saying. Uh, my point is basically about an interesting uh, use case for SOAR. So I. <clears throat> To me, SOAR is basically meant to make things work without human intervention. That's the whole point about orchestration and automation. So one of the things I would love to see is that how do we make sure that any non-compliant machine, and this can be extended to any other sort of thing, is not allowed to access the internet. 
but only allowed to access those URLs which are required to make the machine compliant. And all this happens automatically. To me, it is problem management at its extreme. That if the machine has been online for the you know, specified period of time, but it is non-compliant, it essentially means that some technology has not worked appropriately, has not worked effectively. So source should ensure that that machine cannot connect to the internet. So it is not a problem to anyone. There's no risk. And now you fix the underlying causes due to which it never got, uh, never became compliant. And then let it attend, uh, access the internet. All happening seamlessly without manual intervention, except for sol remediating the root causes of the issue. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important, pertinent point. And that, that unfolds that uh, how uh, do you understand your environment, right? Like you just explained that uh, non-compliant devices, no access. So we know that, uh, yes, there are certain non-compliances and that we, what actually is, we have to block it some. I think that understanding of the context and the environment and the intelligence uh, is really will strengthen your SOAR platform. Otherwise, if you don't understand these use cases, it's going to be very difficult to actually uh, take and automate certain tasks. Very true. Actually, that was a comprehensive overview of uh, SOAR and uh, you know what is the role of SOAR in the future of cybersecurity. So uh, moving with the last question and the most important question to uh, Mr. Uh, Vikram Danda, what role do zero trust principle and identity-centric security play in your overall cybersecurity strategy? And what benefits have you observed from their uh, implementation so far? Yeah. So, first of all, this word itself, zero trust. I like to say that it is not, uh, it's a misnomer, actually. It is essentially what it means is zero implicit trust. And what that means is that if you trust something for a purpose, trust it only for that purpose. Don't extend that trust to other areas. So in this context comes the first principle of zero trust, at least as far as some people define it, that never trust, always verify. And I also say that first verify, then trust. You know, that's the way I sort of try to characterize it. Then once you uh, allowed someone access or you have trusted someone, give the least possible trust, which translates into the principle of least privilege which then that least privilege itself, you start extending it to say and further narrowing it down to say, these are all variations on that theme, on the theme of least privilege. That don't just provide least privilege by itself, but over a, on a time basis as well. And then having done all this, assume breach, that things have already gone wrong. How do you control it? And what we spoke about earlier, network segmentation, brings a uh, is a big plays a big part in that control it contain it so i as you can see i'm a great fan of zero trust i like the fact that nothing should be exposed to the extent possible to the internet whatever is exposed should be exposed for the minimum uh, uh, period of time for the minimum part of the uh, uh, internet control everything what are the benefits you see the biggest benefit is an attack surface. And if your attack surface itself is reduced, there are two benefits of that. One, what you need to work on gets reduced. What you need to manage, monitor, patch, upgrade, update, all that gets reduced. And secondly, of course, the means of ingress that are available to the attackers, those dramatically reduce. Are there technologies available? Yes, they are called today uh, secure web gateways. <clears throat> they are called private access. All these are contributing to the approach which is called zero trust. And that's another point over here. That zero trust is not a solution. It's an approach which is built on those three principles and some of them have even expanded those three principles into seven principles and the others. Doesn't really matter how many principles are there. But what it essentially means that at every step, Minimize your attack surface. Assume you've already been attacked. You have been infiltrated. Control it, contain it. Have I seen uh, benefits practically? Yes, a lot of benefit. And is it quantifiable? The rating platforms that we have, the attack surface management platforms, and there are so many of them today, the bit side, the series scorecards, the 
black kites, the risk recon, they will all consistently rate you much better than the ones which are not following zero trust principles. I think uh, that was a precise and uh, detailed explanation, uh, Vikram sir. So, Vikram sir, any one key takeaway you would like to uh, give to the audience? See, one of the things I would say is cybersecurity is a field where there are so many areas from which you can get inputs regarding what needs to be done. There are so many regulators all telling us what needs to be done. There are vendors telling us what needs to be done. It actually boils down to execution. Can you look at whatever is being told needs to be done? Can you assess what you should be doing in your environment? And then, of course, can do in your environment? And then do it. It's the execution ultimately which matters. There are many, many reasons why we can't execute at all. But can we make sure that we execute the most important parts? Can we stick to the basics? Do that well. And ultimately, cybersecurity is a selfish game. Why selfish? Because the attempt is not to be 100% secure. You can't be 100% secure. But if you can be more secure than your neighbors, then hopefully the attacker will say, why should I bother with you? I will go to your less secure neighbors. That's it. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Vikram sir. Uh, that was a uh, peaceful uh, advice. So uh, there was uh, some uh, question which our audience has asked uh, on social media. And I think uh, we have uh, covered it all uh, in our panel discussion today. So now I would like to take the live questions uh, which uh, the audience are asking in the chat. So uh, I think uh, uh, Nishikant Singh has asked, can SOAR also protect file integrity or system file? Uh, Yusuf sir, would you like to answer this question? Uh, and if you can answer is this this in one minute, that would be helpful. Uh, uh, it in a sense that SOAR is majorly to automate your actions, right? Uh, uh, you can automate uh, responses to it from FIM or EDR, right? So if you find a certain uh, critical system, there have been unauthorized changes, you can always feed into your SIEM. And then, based on the action that you would go do, you can always automate using SOAR. So, SOAR itself cannot guarantee you a file integrity of a file or you can protect, but it can automate the necessary actions required in order for you to take quick response to uh, address uh, if there's any changes, unauthorized changes, or there's kind of data poisoning, or uh, which actually uh, changes the integrity of the file. Uh, Joel J is asking, can uh, zero trust be implemented in conjunction with existing VPNs and firewalls? Uh, Vikram sir, would you like to take this? Yeah. So short answer, I mean, uh, short, short answer is no really speaking. Because see, everything should be fit for purpose, minimum for the purpose. So what does a VPN do typically, the traditional VPNs? They allow you access to the network. Why should you provide access to the entire network? So if you use something like a modern private access solution you get access to what you need to do do it why should you be allowed to roam around the place it's like in an office uh, when you sort of go past the reception if you're a visitor you're probably made to sit in a meeting room and that's it you don't have access to the production areas of the offices likewise the same should apply to the network i think uh, that was a precise answer so uh, all the rest question uh, will be covered after uh, the session so i really like to thank all the panelists for uh, sharing your insightful and thoughtful perspective today on behalf of everyone over here i would like to extend my sincere gratitude for your time and for engaging in such a meaningful discussion uh, thank you so much sir it was it's been a truly enriching uh, discussion and your expertise on this complex topics has given us uh, all the valuable takeaways and here i would like to summarize it for the audience so the panelists emphasized the importance of uh, implementing zero trust principles identity security and micro segmentation to reduce attack surface and improve security however the discussion also revealed some common pain points and challenges that organization face in implementing these security measures including uh, legacy uh, architecture challenges complexity and fragmentation lack of visibility and control 
these pinpoints and challenges provide a natural seg into the presentation of VPN and firewall alternative through Zero Trust, which promises to offer more integrated, holistic, and effective approach to security. 